confidence to me is like looking in the mirror and like loving that person for all yeah. her strengths and her weaknesses and just accepting her and, and, and having empathy and compassion. Like I'm doing my best. Like that's, that's what confidence is. And, and that it doesn't have to be perfect. You, you know, I, I think that so many women in particular are, are paralyzed by getting it right and, and that it might be wrong. And, and I just don't think life is black and white. I think life is gray. And so if you can learn how to just embrace gray and, and get down and dirty and gray and <laughs> like yeah. that's, that's, that's what confidence is. Welcome to Champions Mojo, a podcast to bring out your inner champion. Your hosts are sisters-in-law, Kelly Pallas and Maria Parker. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds national and world records in master swimming. Maria holds world records in endurance cycling and won the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. Both are certified health and life coaches. Our goal is to inspire you through conversations with champions. And now your host, Kelly Palace. Hello friends, welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast where we are going to chat with a woman who has made history in a big way. And as usual, I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Hello, Maria. Hi, Kelly, how are you today? Oh, I am just over the moon <laughs> because uh, Maria- I already, know, I already knew the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> So of all the great champions and Olympic coaches we have interviewed, our guest today stands alone as someone who shattered the glass ceiling for women as the first ever U.S. Olympic swim team head coach, earning this honor at the 2012 Olympics. It's Terry McKeever, the head women swim coach at the University of California, Berkeley, where she has had an amazingly successful career. She served there for 28 seasons. Um, she's also been, besides being the head Olympic coach, she's been the assistant coach twice for the Olympic team, seven times for the world championship team as an assistant coach, two times as the head coach of our Pan Pack team, and was also the head coach for our U.S. World Short Course Championships. And this is just, this stat right here blows me away. She's coached 26 Olympians who have won 36 Olympic medals. And that is just a glimpse at Terry's international resume. Maria, can you share with our listeners her NCAA accomplishments? Sure, Kelly. Terry's Cal teams have won four NCAA titles. She's been voted Pac-12 Coach of the Year eight times, won four Pac-12 team titles, and coached six National Swimmers of the Year, including greats like Natalie Coughlin, Missy Franklin, and most recently Kathleen Baker. These are just a few of her NCAA awards, and her Golden Bears have captured NCAA individual or relay titles an impressive 65 times. We are really in the presence of greatness today, and we couldn't be more excited to talk with this legendary coach. So let's welcome Terry to the show. Terry, welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> excited. Yes, yes. Terry, uh, you know, I have to start off with, you know, the same question that I asked Bob Bowman, who was one of our one of our favorite interviews. And in that interview, if you want to go back and listen to it, I don't know if you have or not, but Bob refers to you, Terry McKeever, as one of his mentors in that interview. And the first question I asked Bob, and there are, there are only a few coaches with the resume like you and Bob Bowman have that I could ask this question, but this is this is the question. If someone had told you 20 years ago that we would be reading this resume, what thoughts go through your head? <laughs> I don't think 20 years ago um, <laughs> that it, it, it would even have been on my radar. I, early in my career at Cal, I remember I had an assistant that said um, he wanted to be an Olympic coach. And I was like, really? I've never even thought about that before. And I, and I hadn't, you know, and, and so it's, it's uh, surreal sometimes for me to think about, you know, that question and, and that journey more than anything from um, that time of my career to now is, I, I just, 
incredibly blessed and fortunate to to have had the experiences that I that I have had. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 great. And and I love that because it shows that we can achieve these amazing things in life sometimes without even you know, necessarily, I mean, goals are always good, right, coach? But sometimes you don't have them and you still get there. You still get there. So so how, how do you get there? How do you get to be the head Olympic coach without saying, this is what I'm aiming for? I, I think you you focus on the journey. You know, I think mm-hmm. being that the head coach or winning the medal is a, is a, a tangible thing you can look at that uh, acknowledges and celebrates your journey. And, and that journey is, is got bumps in the road and it's got great highs and, and lows. And, you know, the, the neat part is, is who you get to walk in that journey with, you know, and, and Bob and I have been able to walk, walk a journey together that I'm, I'm honored and, and humbled to hear has inspired him as, as he's in, inspired me and, you know, a, a handful of other coaches and, and most importantly, your, your athletes and, you know, how I, I look at the amazing women I've had the opportunity to work with at, at Cal and, I, you know, depending on where they are in my career, I feel like I've learned something from them. And then when I had the opportunity to, to start doing some of the international things, I, I think about some of, you know, Jenny Thompson that I had the unbelievable um, opportunity to work with at, at a handful of international meets and, and just learn so much from her. So it's, it's staying open to possibilities. You, you know, I, I always tell the girls and they, you know, that you have a plan for your life. And I, I think that's normal and natural because it puts you in the direction you'd like to go. But don't limit yourself to that plan because I had a plan and the the reality has turned out better than the plan. <laughs> and I think that's that's possible if you if you keep those doors open and you keep challenging yourself and and take advantage of um, the, the opportunities that you find yourself in. Hmm. What was your plan always? I mean, you know, what was the big overarching dream? Well, when I was in college, I was going I have an elementary uh, teaching credential. I thought I would kind of teach fifth grade. I have a secondary credential in math and science. And I thought, okay, I probably could do some high school coach uh, coaching. Um, I'm the oldest of 10. So I always envisioned having my own family. And then I would just like kind of coach high school and live ha- happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> but you swam, you, you swam at a a very high level division one for USC Southern Cal. And, you know, you were an all American and your teams were in the top 10. And did that give you a little taste of, of thinking, Hmm, you know, I can do this. I I'm going to get out there. And once you got your foot in the door, did that, did your experience as that athlete at, at SC help you? Yeah, um, a- absolutely. You know, I think, I think the biggest athletic experience that's influenced my coaching is that, for most of my developmental years, my mom was my coach. And I mean, I belonged to a team and, and we, um, you know, would go maybe to the team practice 20% of the time, 40% of the time. But most of my other practicing was in the backyard with my mom, like racing my brothers or, you know, it was very non-traditional and had to have a lot of accountability on my part to do things. And it, w- it wasn't always easy. You know, sometimes you don't want your mom to be your swim coach, you know, she, you just want her to be your mom. And, <laughs> but uh, it, it was, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I think as an athlete, um, it was kind of, I grew up in, in the era when, you know, a lot of people were going to, you know, moving away from their families and, and going to certain clubs to, you know, to get better as an athlete. And, I'm, I'm just really grateful that I, my mom said, you're not going to do that. You know, I didn't, I didn't have you to let someone else raise you. I, I, I want to, you know, I, I, I want you to stay here. And, you know, I, I, I just, I think back like that's, I'm like so appreciative of that decision for the, the long-term ramifications it's had on, on, you know, my life and my, and my family life, you know, <laughs> 
What kind of what what would you say those ramifications were? Just the character that she gave you, or, or yeah, yeah, character. I think a real sense of like it, it's my career. The coach is is a facilitator, but ultimately it's my career. Um, I think my relationship with my siblings, you know, and and the family dynamic is, you know, I, I three of my siblings were born after I'd already gone to college, you know, and in uh -huh. some ways my my youngest sister is about the same age as Natalie Coughlin. And, and probably even now you add up everything. I probably have spent more hours with Natalie than I've spent with my sister, Christy, you know, and they're 30, 38 years older, yeah. um, 36. So, you know, I, I, I just think I would have missed out on a lot of things that just are, are things that I'm really proud of, of who I am and the way I see the world and the way I see my coaching. And, and that's about, you know, just, I see athletics as a place to, to yes, excel and set a goal and, and achieve, but I also see it as character building and, and learning about our, our strengths and our weaknesses and how to work with the team and how to get knocked down and get back up and, you know, all the, the, the things that, that I think are in, important because you're going to get knocked down in your life, you know, and, and so it's, 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 if we can learn that at a young age, when maybe the stakes aren't as high, I think then we have the confidence that when the stakes get higher, we, we know that we can walk through that journey and come out on the other side. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Yeah, no, that's be That's a great answer. Great answer. So your mom was your coach. And did you realize at a young, at that young age, uh, certainly later and that, the lands, the general landscape of women coaching swimming. Now, at the club level, at the USA level, there are many more uh, women coaches, but still not as many as there are men. But at the college level, they're just, you know, it's a, it's it's a very small percentage of head women coaches that are coaching even women's programs. So, when you were growing up with your mom as a woman coach, do you think did you realize that? that that was unusual or do you think that influenced you to be confident to go into coaching? That's a good question. I, I don't think at that time I really realized it was unusual. You know, I think it was more instead of like a male female thing, I think it was more like, okay, that's your mom. You, you know, like that, that was kind of what was different. It wasn't so much right. male, male, <laughs> male, female. She's um, just your mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so like that, that, that piece was, was what, you know, I can remember being unu unusual, you know, um, I think that what I really noticed when I, I got more into, you know, the, the opportunity to go to SC and sort of have real coaching, I really didn't get much better. And that always like, kind of intrigued me of like, okay, what, why is that? And what, you know, what's my role in that? How, what is, you know, just sort of looking at that, like, okay, you have sort of a non-traditional background and you've achieved success of going to nationals and, and things like that and, and placing, but now you're going to go and swim with more people of your caliber and, and in a, in a more traditional program. And it didn't really result in faster swimming. And, and that, that's always, I think that's my driving uh, force from like, uh, of why I kind of wanted to go into coaching and what it uh, fascinated, fascinated me about it. You know, I, I think the other thing is I would consider my, not so much now, but at a young age, very shy and not really um, wanting to seek a, attention or, you know, I was kind of the one, like if I could get by without anybody noticing me, that would be good. But I, I did want to be noticed as like on the athletic field, you know, and in, in the swimming pool. So it, it gave me a, a sense of confidence and who I was and that I could do something well um, that really cha changed my life, you, you, you know, and I, that's another passion I have about athletics is I, I just see it, you know, I see it helping to blossom people into the people uh, and individuals that they're supposed to become, you, you know, I think it's an awesome avenue for that. Yes, yes. And 
that's one of the things that I really was looking forward to. We were looking forward to talking with you about today is your culture at Cal. So we've, you know, we've talked to several other Olympic coaches, David Marsh and Jack Bowerly and Bob Bowman. And the, you know, culture is something that is thrown around a lot with teams, you know, the culture of your team. And, you know, even though I left coaching NCAA coaching uh, in, in the 90s, I have totally been a student of NCAA women's swimming and stayed in touch with my alma mater, NC State, which happens to be doing really well right now. And um, even the Virginia team, because I'm from Virginia and followed your coaching, of course. And I have a lot of um, my ears to the ground with a lot of these athletes. And certainly we've interviewed a lot of your swimmers and people who know you and you, your you and your program have such a an amazing reputation that your swimmers just love you and they are absolutely feel that your culture is very different than other cultures of NCAA teams. And not to say one is better or worse or, you know, anything, but, you know, you guys swim in the ocean sometimes and you do yoga and you go on retreats and you, you really, it sounds like you really are buying into that, developing the entire person. And I just, I would love to hear what, how you would describe your culture and um, maybe, maybe in comparison to some others or maybe not. Yeah. I I think I'd rather like not, I, I would shy away from the comparison because I always, I feel like, nobody really knows the culture of a program unless you're there day in and day out. You know, you can, you can get um, a glimpse by like watching a meet or whatever, but I think where the really truth of a culture is, is what happens when no one's watching it, 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 And, and that's, you know, one of my most fun, <laughs> not fun things, but I find it interesting to like, like, uh, and I've done this on purpose a couple of times, like be late to practice and see what happens, you know, like what, what, <laughs> what, 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 are, they, you what, know, they what are they, what do they do? Are they going to sit there and wait? Is someone going to take charge? You know, do they like, like, it, it's just, it's to me, that's, that's very like fascinating group behavior, I guess, of like what, what happens. And, you know, I, I think that, I, the way I would describe the culture is there's a huge amount of accountability, accountability to yourself, accountability to your teammates, um, accountability to the women before you and the women coming after you in the institution. You know, there's there's definitely a level of excellence and not not I don't mean excellence in like like we're all going to win. I mean, personal excellence that you're going to bring your best self and you're going to figure out what that is and how does my best self elevate the woman next to me, you you know? And um, I like telling people that I, 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 and I honestly can think of, you know, more than half of the amazing Olympians I've, I've had the opportunity to work with and I can give you two or three women that worked out and, and trained with them on that team that they wouldn't have been that Olympic champion or that Olympic medalist or that, Olympic team member without those other women bringing out the best in them when nobody and nobody's going to ever know their names. But the cool thing is the, the, that Olympian knows their names, you know, and, and, um, and I, I think that's, that is really important. And I think there's also a a high level of account of, you know, I say accountability. I, I know as a young coach, I really shied, like, I really, worried about like, okay, how do I have the perfect team meeting? How do I have the perfect message? When's the perfect time to say it? And what I've really evolved into is that um, there is no perfect time to say it. There's no perfect message. It's, it, you're going to mess it up. I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to misinterpret something. But if, if the people on my team and the people I'm working with know the, the intent behind my comment is to help them be their best. Like I, I am very clear on what our team goals are as, as a program, but I think you have to be clear on what you, the, the individual athletes goals are. And then my job is to hold them to that. And if, 
if there's a consistent behavior that is uh, contrary to that, I'm going to ask them, you know, I'm going to check in, are, are these still your goals? And, and if they are, then, you know, X, Y, Z needs to change, or can you see how X, Y, Z is not in line with that? You know, so either you need to change X, Y, Z, or you need to readjust your, your goals. Cause you don't get to say, you know, you don't get to say, I want to be an Olympian and then miss practice uh, three times a week, you, you know, like you don't get to yeah. say both of those things, like your, your actions, your behavior needs to match what you say you're, you're going to do. And um, we're going to hold you to that standard. And, and at any time, if you don't want that still to be your goal, that's, it's your career. It's total, it's your goal, but you kind of can't have, you can't have it both ways, you, you know, and, and that's not always comfortable. And I, I don't always say it in a way that's warm and fuzzy. I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, <laughs> but hopefully, you, you know, that that people know that um, it's it's really coming from a place of wanting to do, every, you know, if, if you're going to tell me that's what's your goal, then I'm all in on, on that goal. And I have to be honest and upfront if if I think that we're we're not, it, you know, you're you and I aren't moving in the direction of attaining that goal. So, yeah, that's, that's I, great. I, I, I like that answer because that was, that, that partly answers my next question, which is, you know, and, and this is gonna be hard for you to answer because you sound so humble, but you are an incredibly effective coach, clearly. In addition to, you know, just go, coming beside your athletes and saying, okay, you said you were going to do this. Now, why are you not doing it? Or, you know, <laughs> you know, what, what other questions, qualities make you so effective? <laughs> well, I'm not always effective, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I knew that would be hard for you to answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think, I think it's because I, I don't, I don't believe there's one way to skin a cat, so to speak. You know, I, I don't think there's one way to go 57 seconds and a hundred backstroke. You know, I think it's, I think it's individual. Like I, I, you know, I, obviously I get to coach Natalie and she's an amazing underwater swimmer. And then about two years later, a young lady, Helen Silver won the 200 backstroke at NC Chways and she wasn't very good underwater. Now, if I had said, well, Helen, na this is how Natalie did it. You need to do this. I, she probably never would have been her best. D D does that make sense? You, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, mm -hmm. and I feel like, I, I feel like that's what happened to me in my swimming career that when I got in a team environment and you, you know, we've got five 200 butterflies and we're being told we all should swim it the same way that, that never made sense to me because we don't all have the same strengths. We don't, you know, it, it's to me being your best is like, yes, you need to work on your, your weaknesses or things that you need to do better. But what you really need to do is figure out what you do well and exploit the heck out of it. You, you know, like this is what, this is what I am better than anybody else in. And this is what I'm, I'm going to put just as much time of elevating my strengths as I am of, of working on my, my shortcomings, you know? And I think, I think that's athletically. I think that's um, in your, your job, you know, whatever uh, your, our, our skills are, we're all, you know, we all have strengths that we're, we're confident in and, and we feel we do a really nice job in, and then things that, that we want to keep improving on. And I think sometimes particularly coaches get, I, I mean, I get this way. I'm focusing on what's not working instead of focusing on what is and really like exploiting it, you know? And, and um, I, I think that is an important part of making sure a variety of athletes and individuals can be successful. Oh, oh I love that. my gosh. I love, I, I love I, that answer. <laughs> I hope coaches are listening because, yes. um, you know, if I'm a swimmer I hope out par there. Parents, parents yeah. are listening. I, I want parents to listen. I don't want other yeah. coaches to hear that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. If I'm a swimmer out there listening, I'm going to go swim for Cal. <laughs> but um, the so another way to ask the question that you just asked, Maria, which we love to, to know, too, that in this um might be a little easier on your humility is what characteristics do you, Terry McKeever, have 
that you think have helped you just like that you're obviously I would say one that I've I've pegged you for is being very creative I mean just the fact that you're you know there's more than one way to skin a cat is very creative so would you agree you're creative and what other strengths or characteristics do you use that have made you successful I hope people think I'm creative that's innovative and think outside of the box. I'm, I'm willing to take a chance. And then I'm willing to say that was great. And I'm willing to say, oh, that was stupid, but we're not going to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I, I think I am pretty hardworking and focused on just focused on results. And, and, and I, I want to say success. And that sounds kind of like, like it means medals, but I don't, I, 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 it's success. I, I think success can be defined in so many different ways. And I, I think it's like, I'm, I'm committed to learning too and growing and challenging myself and the people around me, you, you know, and, and um, I, I'm, I'm what, one of the best way one of the best compliments one of my athletes gave me when she graduated is she said she learned how to fail quickly and move on and and i and i think that is something i've personally had to work on and if uh, i i feel like i if i can help people recognize that failure or a setback is an opportunity not something to shy away from but almost like walk into like, you know, like, like she said, like fail quickly. And then like, let's go like, okay, we're going to change direction or we're going to go here. Or or I know why I failed. Now I'm going to make this adjustment. I think, I think that is what is really important to me. What's implied in your answer is that we have to fail. I mean, that, that you're not afraid to fail, you know, that let's, let's try this and be willing to fail and then let's learn from it. And, and I will say I was afraid, afraid to fail. I was paralyzed and failing and thought that if I failed, I was letting myself down and letting down the people I cared about. And it took a lot of work to realize like, you know what, like any failure I've had, like, I don't want to walk through some of those, but uh, like, I'm, I'm really like proud of like what resulted the result of that failure, you know, whether it be a change of mindset, if it's the way I look at myself, the way I look at a different situation, or I, like, I, I feel like that is really important. Like, I don't think Terry McKeever 20 years ago would be able as hopefully successfully walk through what we're going through right now, because I, I would have been so distracted with not being able to predict and control things. And that doesn't distract me anymore because I'm like, I feel like I can go with the flow and that whatever is going to happen, I'm going to, I, I have enough confidence to know that I'm going to make the most of it and it's, it's going to be okay. You know? Uh, um, And is it going to, you know, are we, walking into a year that we have no idea what, you know, a year to 18 months that we have no idea what it's going to look like. Yeah. And, and it's going to require, you know, it's going to require new skills from every leader, from every champion (laughs) and, and the, the leaders and the champions that can be adaptable can make decisions and pivot are, are going to be the ones that are going to, I think, come out on the other end of this in a, healthier, more positive light. Let's talk about that, Terry. So this comes under the heading of obstacles. You know, we love to hear, you know, what have been some major obstacles in your life or any, but this, this pandemic is obviously a huge obstacle in the swimming community. Uh, So what, when that hit, you know, NCAAs are canceled. I mean, I, you know, I, I have been to every single NCAA championships, even though I left coaching and I've watched you and I've watched your teams and, you know, there was so, it was just going to be so exciting this year and, you know, it didn't happen. So NCAA is, is canceled and then, you know, Olympic trials and Olymp, you know, Olympics and moved. What, what did you, what were your initial emotions and feelings and how you kind of dealt with that if you can walk us through, we love 
real concrete stories of this. Can you share some some of that? Well, I, I know when it first, like we were up in Seattle for Pac-12s and, you, you know, that uh, I'm watching the news and it that is really where, you know, a lot of things started and it was kind of, I think we were kind of lighthearted about it. And then, and then I, you know, I start looking at like, okay, we're, I, I, I can remember uh, my assistant, Danny texted me and said the NBA season, um, they just canceled the NBA season games or whatever. And I was like, we're screwed. <laughs> like <laughs> we're not going, yeah. we're, we're not yeah. going yeah. anywhere, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and I actually, um, it was, I think Thursday, the 12th of, of March. And, and I'm the one blessing in all this is we, the girls were in the weight room and I was talking to the NCAA group was in the weight room. And before weight started, I was talking to them that, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Neither does any of the publications, just like everybody's guessing what's going to go, go on. I said, you know, I really, I, I think it's fair to say, I don't think there will be uh, people in the stands and you know what, that's okay. We like that. We can use that to our, our advantage, you know, and kind of going through things. And my, I, I don't usually have my phone at practice, but I, I had my phone and it, it text uh, and it was my super, my sports supervisor. And she said uh, that they canceled packed, they canceled NCAAs right when I'm talking to him. And I was just like, okay, well, Jenny just text me. I need to go check up on something. I'll be back. You know? So I, I went and just asked her to like, I go, so we're not going anywhere. And she said, no, they canceled everything. And I said, okay, well, I need to go down to the weight room. And I, walked in and like, like the, the two seniors that were done, like one of them just like lets out like, no. And I'm like, I, I just was like, I didn't say anything. They just knew by the way I was looking like, okay, this, and, and, you know, we're standing there. Some are crying. Some are, are just, uh, you know, can't really believe it. And I, I remember just saying like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say right now. I said, I, I want so badly to be able to say something to make it make you feel better. And, um, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I, I said, what, you know, what would you like to do? Do you want to stay here? Do you want to go down to the pool? Like, what do, what do you want to do? I think it'd be great if we just kind of spent, um, a couple minutes together and just like, like I'm a big proponent of like, when you get news like that, you just have to kind of sit with it. And like I said, some are crying, some don't know what to do. And so ironically, it was like big give on campus and um, the development person had cupcakes. And I go, can I have the cupcake? Can I have some cupcakes? <laughs> and so <laughs> I took like 20, 20 cupcakes we, and we just went down to the pool and, you know, some of them were, were got in and swam and some of them were just kind of sitting there and we just, uh, I said, okay, well, let's just, you know, come back, like, and then we have some that obviously have international aspirations. I'm like, let's, let's not worry about tomorrow. We'll come back tomorrow afternoon. And, and we'll just see like a lot of stuff's going to happen, you know, and, and I mean, we were able to, and then we were going into spring break. So we, we were able to keep our, our Olympic qualifiers um, training. And then pretty soon they shut everything down. And, and we still, the city of Berkeley has still not opened up pools so that's been kind of frustrating and not kind of, it's been frustrating that, you know, I just made a decision that the girls are better off at, at home than they would be here, obviously not being able to swim. So just trying to do a lot of things to um, connect the group. You know, we, we have weekly, uh, twice a week meetings and doing a lot of things where the girls are running the meetings and at, uh, we elected captains. We had a, a banquet, a virtual banquet that in some way, I mean, it was in some ways it was like really cool. Like, it, it, you know, I, I, I had people that it was like three in the morning in Sydney. So they're in their bed. And then it was like seven 30 at night in England. And so her and her family were out by the fire pit and, and um, <laughs> you, you know, we, 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 did some things similar, but a little bit different. And uh, this time I, I had them, if they won an award, they sort of had to give like a acceptance speech. And I really had never had that before. And it was just the emotion and the heartfelt words that were shared in, in some, it was a very surprisingly, a very intimate um, 
uh, event, you know, I just felt it was really important for this team to, it was like, we kept it the same day, the same time. Like I was like, okay, everything else got changed. We're not going to, we're, we're going to change, we're not going to change the time or the date. We're going to keep this the same and we're going to try to provide some sort of closure. And then we've been trying to kind of move forward, not knowing what moving forward looks like. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There's your creativity right there again that is such a- yeah that sounds like it was better what you implied is that it's better in some ways than it, it would have been in real life with everybody yeah together. i mean it it yeah it, it it truly was and you know we elected about three weeks ago that um captains uh, we were having when some people were like you know they're taking class or they can't miss i go i'm just getting the sense that like it like they don't want it people don't want to meet and and like what what do you guys think and so they asked people and they came back and they're they're saying well people say like you know it's kind of like depressing you don't you don't have any news for us or whatever and so I deferred to Danny while I took a deep breath and I was like I, I said you think or it's hard because you don't and I go you think it's hard now um <laughs> like like it's it's going to like this is nothing it's going to get harder and so we're going to you know, we're, we, we made some modifications, but ultimately I, I, I got to the point where I realized what the charge for me was, is like, I'm still having to do all the things that I do when I coach. And the part I love the most of going to the pool, I haven't been able to do for four, four months. And I said to the captains, I go, you know what, you may not want to meet, but I need to see all your faces on the square on my computer so that I, it keeps me going because otherwise I don't know why I'm doing this and I need to, I need to just see you. So you're going to meet so that I can see you <laughs> and, <laughs> I love you're going, that. And, and you're going to inspire me, you know? And so <sighs> the, the next meeting, I, they ran the meeting without the coaches. And I, I don't know what, I don't know if they shared that exactly, but I, I said like, you know, I want them to under, I want you all to understand why I want to keep meeting. Like, and I think we can do some things that we haven't had as much time to do. And, and we can do, like we've, I've been doing some stuff from um, Brene Brown's like Dare to Lead. And we've done some stuff from The Power of Now. And um, uh, the captains uh, ran a meeting. And then we have family, uh, what we call family pods. So every incomer, has um, at least three to four returners that, that that's their family pod. And so where we are right now, every Thursday, um, a, a, a new family pod runs the meeting with the idea that we're doing things to connect and learn, learn about each other that we wouldn't have as, you know, as much time to do if we were you know, probably traditionally swimming or whatever. So it's, it's been pretty neat. I'm not a real tech savvy person but i i do think that as weird as it is we're we're really getting some good foundation work of of just like what's important to us as a program and you know we did a, a lot of things around values um individual values and team values and it's it's been um i i feel very good about that so we'll Hopefully it translates into to good swimming as well. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, the, and you're helping them grow as people, which in the end is, is, is what you would hope that their four years with you would, would do. And also you're teaching them and telling them, this is what I need. You're teaching them to tell people what they need. And, and I mean, it's just that was a beautiful story. Yes, I could I could see being in that weight room and having that news delivered and Yes, that's amazing. So Terry, you've you've obviously you're coaching tons of these great champions now and so many historically as we read your resume. What commonalities do you see that some of these top champions share? Um I think a lot of them are uh driven and I think a lot of them hold each other hold themselves to a, a standard that is that of excellence, you know, I, I think that they hold the people around them, you know, whether it be me or their teammates. I think they're also willing to take risk and challenge themselves. I, I think they're they're constant constantly learning and like looking for uh, efficiency and I, I think continual learners. 
And I think they have a good sense of self. And most of them are pretty comfortable in their own skin. Confidence. Yeah. Do you think those things can be taught? Or do you think that they kind of are intrinsic? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that really, really exceptional skills like that. I think God gave you some of that or your, your upbringing gave you some of that. You know, I think, I think by the time that I I think I can move someone along a a confidence spectrum um, or a, um, a, a willingness to learn or a willingness to take chances or, uh, you know, an accountability. I think, I think you, we all have the ability to help facilitate people moving along that spectrum, but that exceptional sense of self and like they're starting from a, a higher place than their peers, if, if that makes sense. You, you know, I, I think it's, it, so whether that's intrinsic and they were born that way, or it's a byproduct of both their, you know, nurture and nature of, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is, is your formative years, you know, particularly, um, as, as a young person. And I, I think we're all formed by, you know, our, our families and our, where in, in, in the United States, we grow up and all those, those different things. I, I, I laugh. I told you I was the oldest of 10, you know, and, and um, during this time we've been doing a uh, Sunday zoom calls. I think it, it wasn't last week. It was a week before, but we were saying how one of my sisters grew up in the same environment, but her interpretation of what happened is really, really different than mm-hmm. most of us, <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. just, it's, it's just, it's, it, that's fascinating to me. I was like, what, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, and I think that the same thing, it, you know, happens, uh, you know, happens when, when you get, that's the, to me, that's one of the, the best parts about being a college coach is there's a couple things. I, I love, the sport of swimming for its individual nature. You know, I I love the fact I I loved it as an athlete that if I worked hard, I, I had control over my destiny, so to speak, you know, I don't need someone to pass me the ball to score. You know, I, I can, I can control that, but on the college level, I need my teammate to be on that same level of commitment, right? Like you don't win a national championship with one good swimmer. Like I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm convinced the, where you win a national championship isn't in your your elite level. It's the level right below it. That if, if the level right below it, uh, like if you can get those people to step up to to your champion levels, that's that's when you win a, as a as a team. And, and that's that's where you're you reach your potential as a team, whether it means winning or 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 not. I um I I just think that that is really like that's the the neat part and and I like the idea of that it start there's a start and a stop every year you know I like that we start in August and we kind of stop in March and then you know you have a summer and then like now we're starting again and there's new people and and I really enjoy for the most part being someone's last coach I, I enjoy connecting the lessons of sport to the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Like that's, that is really important to me. Oh, I love it. So we're, we're getting close on time. I just, do you have a proudest moment of your career? (laughs) You know, I did an interview about three weeks ago and they asked me, asked me what my proudest moment was. And I said, probably like winning um, a national team title being being on the Olympic staff and then definitely being the head coach but I think we were we were working on picking captains and we had a meeting where um, I had 10 women turn in what I'd asked them to be for a captain and speak of why they wanted to be a captain on the team and like that's one of my proudest moments too, that, that there there's 10 women that feel confident enough in their own skills to tell their peers, like, I'm willing to lead, lead here. And this is what I'll do, you know? And like that, that's pretty, pretty awesome too, or to like see somebody achieve something they didn't think they could do. Those are like, those are really nice. And, and the other thing when like, 
when, you know, you mentioned all those amazing statistics or whatever. And I think I'm, I'm proud of the national titles, but I'm, I'm one of the things I'm really proud of is 11 years. And I don't know what I do with this year. Hopefully it, it would have been 12, but 11 years um, in the top three nationally, because to me, that means it wasn't just one person or one recruiting class, but it's a, it's a program, it's a culture, it's a system that has allowed a number of women to come in and be their collective best. And that is, is pretty, um, pretty cool. So if I had to pick one, that's a very long answer. If I had to pick one, I think that's, that's the one I, I kind of like hanging my hat on, if that makes sense. (laughs) Yes, yes. And that was, that's a stat that we didn't even give, but you know, now that I'm reading through all the stuff, that's right. Top three, 11, probably 12 years in a row is just phenomenal. That is, that is so hard to do. (laughs) And I'm so inspired by your desire to, to help these athletes become their, their fully realized selves, you know, fully realized athletes, but also, you know, and, and, and you commenting that how moved you were that what 10, 10 of your athletes wanted to stand up and be leaders, you know, that, that's a beautiful, beautiful statistic um, and really, really inspiring to me. Yeah. And, you know, Terry, one of the things that we've, we've interviewed a lot of college coaches, all men, <laughs> yeah, and yep, um, yep. they, they have said their number one problem with their women is they lack confidence. Now I would just the observation of 10 of your women standing up and wanting to be captains. I don't think your girls have that problem. No, no. Yeah, I mean, I mean they, they, they do, but then I think, you know, confidence looks like, I think what we're trying to help them is like confidence is, it looks a lot of different ways. Right. You know, and, and that, that confidence to me is like looking in the mirror and like loving that person for all yeah. her strengths and her weaknesses and just accepting her and, and, and having empathy and compassion. Like I'm doing my best. Like that's, that's what confidence is and and that it doesn't have to be perfect you, you know i i think that so many women in particular are are paralyzed by getting it right and and that it might be wrong and and i just don't think life is black and white i think life is gray and so if you can learn how to just embrace gray and and get down and dirty and gray and <laughs> like yeah. that's 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 what confidence is you, you know and knowing that i i can i can manage it and and i i think you have to manage it in lots of different areas in in your in your life to know that you can you can get out you know it, it's why i think some of them are struggling so much and this probably people don't want parenting advice from someone who doesn't have her own children. But in, in a lot of ways, I have parented a lot of people, right? <laughs> Younger yes, siblings, yes, but a lot of yes. people in coaching. And I think the thing I'm seeing now is that that the environment that their young people are being raised in, it doesn't allow for them to make a mistake. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like if you don't make a mistake or someone comes and swoops in when you make a mistake, how do you get confidence that you can manage when things don't go well you're you're waiting for someone to come in and swoop in and fix it for you right Mm -hmm. like if we don't let them learn how to fix it themselves and and be okay with it not being being uncomfortable right it's okay Mm -hmm. to be uncomfortable we don't most people don't you know you don't die from being uncomfortable it's like it's part of living is is being uncomfortable and um and makes when things are going well that you know, that, that much better. And, and I think that might, you know, that might be something that hopefully people are experiencing now and, and, and can gain some, you know, confidence and strength, strength from this, this unusual time. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're all uncomfortable. So um, that's almost the perfect question to leave on, but Maria, you want to ask our very last question before we go to the fun round? Yeah. I, I, you've said so much, but is there anything else that you, you'd like to share that we haven't covered? 
No, we've probably had enough of Terry for the afternoon. Uh, I would, <laughs> no, I would highly, highly disagree with that. I am, I'm just, I'm just soaking it all in. I mean, as a parent, although my children are grown and just, you know, in coaching people and helping people, just that, that last point you made about having compassion for yourself and being willing to fail and then being compassionate to yourself when you fail is just beautiful. Yeah, no, I, I, I could go another hour easily, but yep, I know we've got to get you off, off yep. the call here. And um, yep. But we do have, Terry, we have a fun little, we call it the sprinter round, where our listeners can get to know you a little better. It's just a one word answer. Are you ready to play? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Blue. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk chocolate. Kickboard or no kickboard? No kickboard. Mountains or beach? Beach. Football or baseball? Football. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Coffee or tea? Tea. Morning person or night owl? Mm, Depends. Night owl right now. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Okay. Fingernail polish for you or none? Fingernail polish. Okay. Mm, Nice. Okay. I get the next ones. What's your favorite color, Terry? Blue. Favorite swim complex. I think we know the answer that you swim in in the U.S. I think Berkeley. Speaker. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you... Do you listen to music or do you have a pre-race, uh, pre-meet playlist? No. Okay. We know you Whatever have. the girls like. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, what's your shoe size? 10. Okay. And we know you have nine siblings. Uh, what's your favorite Star Wars character? Oh, man. I don't even... Uh, I think I've only seen the first Star Wars. That's embarrassing. I, I would say Princess Leia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, can you cook? Uh, yes, even though my husband doesn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a nice quality in a husband. That is, as far yeah. as <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is one we usually ask our swimmers, but I think it's good for you too. What word comes to mind most when you dive in the water? Uh, more of like a, ah, uh, like one my favorite thing in the world is to dive in the water and be the first one in the water when the sun's out and you can see like your shadow swimming on the bottom. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I love it. Oh, Terry, this has just been such a joy and a pleasure and a yes. privilege. So, yes. um, thank you. Thank, thank you very oh, thank much. You. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your wisdom. It's been terrific. Yeah. And we wish you, yeah. We wish you all the best going forward. Thank you very much. I uh, I uh, am blessed to have an uh, amazing opportunity to do what I love and um, at a place I love. So life is good. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Take right. care. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Takeaways, takeaways, takeaways. We've heard from you that your favorite section of our podcast is the takeaways. Thank you so much for that feedback. But before we get to the takeaways today, we wanted to ask you if you would please give us a five-star review. That way, more people will be able to find our podcast. Also, if you could subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, you'll never miss a podcast episode if you subscribe. And please share our podcast with your friends. And now, the takeaways. Well, Maria... There we have it, the first ever woman Olympic head swimming coach, and what a great interview. There was so much there. (laughs) Yeah, such a modest, sort of unassuming manner, but then everything she said was just a drop of honey wisdom. (laughs) You know, I just, I wanted to just open my mouth and have her keep on talking. (laughs) I know, very, very powerful stuff. What was your first takeaway? Uh, well, uh, there was so much there. It's hard to really hard to distill it. But what what I love, and I guess it's sort of a weakness for me, and maybe for a lot of us, is just this willingness to fail and be okay about it and pivot. You know, it's like that a failure is not a failure. A failure is an opportunity. And so you you know, the more you fail, that means the more um, you know the the more times you tried something new, and of course you're going to grow from that. And you know, just to have the confidence in that 
the to ability to say, okay, we're going to try this. Oops, it didn't work. Not oops, but oh my goodness, it didn't work. Well, I learned from that instead of saying, oh, I thought that, you know, instead of feeling bad about that. So I, I love that. I think that any truly successful person has to have that attitude. And I'm really trying to learn it in my, in my business and in my personal life too. It's, you know, it's okay. A, a, a failure, a no is, is, is only an opportunity for something better. Yes. That's, that's just a huge nugget. I mean, yeah. it's, it's kind of a uh, standard for, you know, I've heard that you really don't become great until you fail. Like you just, yeah. you've just yeah. got to have those failures till, yeah. till you can reach that, that greatness. So I yes. love that. My first takeaway and I think kind of the theme of this, of, of Terry's coaching career is that she's, she's incredibly creative, yeah. uh, and innovative. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in that she's not, she's willing to make a mistake. She's willing right. to say, right. um, you know, and another, for those of you that know coaches, um, Eddie Reese, the, you know, most, uh, decorated, probably the most decorated men's NCAA swimming coach is a, is another, coach that's famous for being innovative and he he says oh well, i messed up my tape i messed up the taper if we did this it didn't work you know so she is incredibly creative she's innovative she said you know there's more than one way to skin a cat i loved her story about helen silver who yeah. was not a, as good at underwaters and if she had tried to you know fix it fix Ellen, Helen to be like Natalie Coughlin, well, then it, that would not have worked. But Helen right. ended up being an NCAA champion because she trained her like Helen needed to be trained. So I like that, um, that each individual swimmer needs to be coached to their individual needs. Right. And then just the, that concept of continuing to be creative in it. And she talked about it you know, you, you got the feeling too, when she was talking about how they're managing the, the coronavirus, uh, you know, just, she's trying different things with the team and, you know, and, and to do that year after year after year, she's been at it for a long time and she's still trying new things. She's still, you know, she's still changing and being, so I love that quality in her. I totally agree. Very important takeaway. Yes. How about your second one? Uh, the second one, I, she didn't really say it, but I just took it from everything she said and I really, really like it. And she seems to be living her life this way. Is that just really the long game is more important than any individual win or any individual performance that, you know, she she's trying to to raise, not raise that, you know, she, although she did sort of refer to herself as a parent, but she's trying to help influence and train these young athletes to become better people. And more successful people. And that, you know, and even in the end, you know, talking about her, you know, what she's really proud of is that, to, that for 11 years, she's been in the top three, you know, just that this long, that isn't about any individual swimmer, that isn't about any individual year, that isn't, that's just about, you know, going for the long haul and trying to do the right thing every day. And that's more important than, you know, whatever this next, you know, moment of, of, you know, potential shine is. So I, I love that about her. Yeah. The long game can be so hard if one is impatient yeah. and yeah. yet it's just, it, it's, it's everything. So that, that was a beautiful takeaway. Yeah. And my second and last takeaway is exploiting your strengths. So this is, you know, this comes under positive psychology. You know, we love yeah. positive psychology, which is yeah. focusing on your, your signature strengths and, yeah. Not, yeah, she just read out to, and said it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. not trying to fix things that are that are broken, but hey, working on those things that you're really strong at, and I think that's a great way to approach life, to approach swimming. You know, I I I feel like uh, when someone wants to be really good in swimming, you can be kind of average at all four strokes, and yet once you really focus, okay, I'm really a breaststroker you can take those big leaps. And I think that's something that we could apply to our lives of just, you know, what am I really good at? And let's focus on that. And it, it, if you're, if you're trying to achieve some big goal. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And it also goes along with the kind of confidence building. You know, it's like, if you're focusing on what you know, you're good at, and you're trying to make that better, you know, of course, you also want to improve, I guess, your weaknesses, but, but it's such a better, just, 
it's a better perspective to tell yourself, okay, this is what I'm good at. I'm going to really make e- make myself even better in this. And that, you know, that's a, that's a very positive, as you said, positive, uplifting uh, way to move forward. So I love that too. Yes. Yes. Well, Maria, there we have it. I guess we can retire the podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Just I'm kidding. So, so glad we got to talk to Terry. Yeah, she's like she's we, just amazing. She was amazing. Like you said, I've been I've been jonesing to have her on the show since kind of the very first inception of the show. So it only took what eighty shows to get her. Yeah, but that's hey, not so bad. She's she's You're been a busy persistent. woman. And persistence. <laughs> I was in it for the long game. So. Yes, you were. <laughs> anyway, all right, Maria, I love you so all right, much. Love you too, Thanks. Kelly. Thank you so much. Talk, we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This week's quote of the week comes to us from Terry McKeever. What you really need to do is figure out what you do well and exploit the heck out of it. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cobra Media and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.